have with us a special guest, Anthony Reynolds. Here he comes on down here. <laughs> just tell everybody maybe where you're from, where you traveled here from, and just a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Uh, my name is Anthony Reynolds. I go by Tony. Um, live in Wilmington, North Carolina for the last eight years. Um, for that, I grew up in Cary, um, but lived in New York and Los Angeles for 17 years or something like that. Moved back here to raise kids. Um, wrote this film. I started it in Los Angeles back in like 06. Put it down for a few years and then picked it back up in, I don't know, 2012. Developed it for two years and then we shot it in February of 2014 um, in a little community called Kelly, North Carolina, which is just inside of Bladen County, right on the Cape Fear River. So um, we shot it in four days. Well, actually, 3 p.m. till 3 a.m. for four nights. And then uh, we've been doing festivals with it for the last year and a half, coast to coast and internationally, and uh, we're kind of rounding up the festival run right now. So um, I'm currently writing the feature film. I was just in Montana. They're trying to get me to bring it to Montana to film it out there. And uh, got to get some people attached and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, that's my story. Well, I guess I will see if anybody from our audience has any questions for Anthony. Or Tony, should I yeah, call, just call you Tony? Okay, Tony. Any questions? Yes. Um, Tony, could you, could you describe the, the casting process? I saw some great, great faces, great westernized kind of faces out for you. Yeah, they're, every one of them are my friends. Um, but they're all professional actors. Um, I've been doing. I've been in the movie business for 23 years. I started in 1993 out in Los Angeles. Uh, did my first movie, which is a western out there, uh, with Bruce Dern and Randy Travis and a bunch of guys. It was a USA TV movie, and that was called Dead Man's Revenge. Um, it was a movie of the week back when the networks made movie of the weeks. Um, and uh, you know, I watched westerns growing up with my dad, and he was a state trooper here in North Carolina, and that just kind of. I don't know, I just kind of, I've always had a passion for those. And I've never seen a, a Western necessarily told through the eyes of a Southerner, you know, in the deep South, because we did have cattle ranches in the South. And um, so I, I, I affectionately call it an Eastern instead of a Western. But um, yeah, as far as casting went, um, Jim Cody, uh, who played Percy, is one of my best friends on the planet. He, he lives in LA and we we brought him in from LA. I don't, yeah, well, he was the original Pace Pecani cowboy that said, New York City. I don't know if you remember those commercials from 25 years ago. Yeah. But Jim's got over 125 credits between film and television and commercials. And he and I, to this day, I mean, I talked to him day before yesterday. And um, we talk every week. We're still great friends. So I wrote Percy for him. And then Cullen Moss, who plays kind of the bad apple, Lonzel. Uh, I wrote that role for Cullen. Cullen and I have worked a lot together, and um, if uh, we go up against each other a lot for the same roles in film and television now. Um, but Cullen's been on The Walking Dead and just a ton of big shows. He's actually in Birth of a Nation, which is in theaters right now. And then uh, Mike Holmes, who played the kind of the comic relief in the film, uh, Waddell. He's one of my best friends. I see him every week. We audition together all the time. He's uh, actually a professor at UNCW in the theater department, and he's been on The Walking Dead and Rectify and Homeland and just a bunch of stuff as well. Um, now, Fidius Reyes, who played Miss Ledbetter, Ledbetter is my mom's maiden name. Um, it's a Western North Carolina name, and the story took place in Western North Carolina, but you know we had a crew of 45 to 50 every night for those three nights, and just to put that number of people up in a uh, a motel or hotel up in the mountains and have all the gear and the trucks and everything we needed it was just cost prohibitive so we found a this location out on the um, uh, it's a farm out in Craven or in uh, Bladen County right on the there's a there's a big hook on the Cape Fear River and my producing partner Sean found this this little this little shack there was featured on um, under the dome a TV series that was shot in Wilmington so we contacted their uh, locations manager. She turned us on to the farm owner. We went out there and met with him, and he wanted a mint for us to film on his farm because he had already had Hollywood money. And so we negotiated with him, Mr. Porter, and finally he let us come out. So we had to completely 
the outside of that little shack had over 125 deer antlers on it. So we had to remove, it's a hunting, it's a hunting lodge. So we had to remove all those and then we had to redo the entire, in, the inside of the place to make it look period. And um, yeah, so um, that was a lot of fun. But then, uh, but Phidias, we found her, uh, she's an actress from the Bronx, her sister Judy Reyes, who was on Scrubs and she's on, um, on uh, a show, another show that's on right now called Devious Maids. But Phidias uh, is from the Bronx and I got her hooked up with a dialect coach so she could learn the Gucci, uh, Gucci accent from the South Carolina lowlands. Um, and then let's see who else. Uh, Rob Trevelier came through as a last minute recasting because it cast another actor to play Amos um, and he had to bow out because he got a really fat paying job out of state. So I got Rob as a friend out of Charlotte and he's actually playing Ben Affleck's father right now in The Accountant. So um, we're all working actors, we're hacks, we're a bunch of character actors. I play cowboys, cops, and killers all the time in movies, and you've seen me out there. I, I've got this, I'm usually re, really clean cut and clean shaven, and I've got this, I'm getting ready to do a movie with Rob Reiner up in D.C. next month. So I've got this beard on, beard for that right now. I can't wait to shave. My fiance can't wait for me to shave either. And in case anybody didn't know, you were the sick man. Yeah, 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 I was, I was the sheriff. I was, uh... Hard to recognize him. Yeah, I was, uh... Uh, Shepard Chilko, the the federal marshal, the ailing federal marshal. So, yeah. I, I, mean, I noticed they had a lot of um, they're, they're great actors because you, you, you told the story to a lot of close-ups. You know, yeah. Like reaction, and I, I thought uh, I thought that was interesting. Well, the stories that I you know what we do as actors, it's in the eyes. Yeah. You know, you gotta if you believe their eyes, you believe them, and you know that's. One of the com that's one of the kind of comments we've gotten consecutively through the festivals for the last year and a half is we shot a lot of close-ups. And we shot actually out on a farm. We, we lit it with that fire. That was really the only lighting we had around us or around those guys at the fire. And just what that light did to the guys as far as lighting them was just beautiful. And then we did some, we had one crane, a scissor lift with a, um, with a flood out to the woods just so you could see just a, the shimmer of trees in the the deep background, but yeah, we shot a lot of close-ups um, because it becomes a more intimate story around that fire, and you kind of get to, to build those relationships, and hopefully everybody had their own voice and their own kind of persona. We even got down to our, our wardrobe designer, Keith uh, T Taylor, specifically designed each of those costumes for each character based on their history, and I had written each of those characters their own history, and Lonzel he's kind of the bad apple and he had moved kind of into town so he had more of an upscale city look with mm -hmm. the little tie and that kind of thing and I just thought Keith had did a marvelous job on putting those pieces together to just to sell each character as being specific. Yes sir? If you could cast anybody from Hollywood for those roles, who would you cast? Oh boy. Um, well those guys are going to play the roles when we do the feature but I'm, I'm, I'm in of talked to Bill Pullman, I've talked to a couple other people for some of the other roles. I've worked with uh, Sam Elliott before and Henry Rollins, and I got, I got some other people that will play other significant roles in the film when, the, the, when, the, when we do the feature, but um, I, I don't want to replace these guys, because they're just, I mean, they're, we're all character actors, and we've all made our careers doing what we do, and this is just one of those little films to showcase what we do, you know, so I don't know that I would replace any of them, but... Um, there's a, you know, I'm, I'm good friends with Billy Bob Thornton, and we, we've worked together on four or five films, and, you know, I just, um, I want Billy in the film if he can work it in his schedule, but he's a busy, busy man, so. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Bravo. Thank you. Uh, well, our film was kind of unique in that we didn't have movie horses. Uh, these these guys, the horses that we found, and it's just a budgetary thing, our horses were like poodles. Um, they're a farmer, his name's Jack Johnson, he lives in Whiteville, North Carolina. My producing partner was tasked with finding horses for the film, and you know, a team of horses for movies, they're about $60,000 a week. Um, and that comes with wranglers and food and travel and blah 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 and all that so Jack offered up his horses for free But if you took one of those mares away from the others they neighed they were just they had to be together 
Um, and so they were one of our biggest stumbling blocks in slowing us down production-wise because they're moving and they're, we had the, the shot of Jim as he's riding off there at the end. We actually digitally removed a man holding the horse so it didn't take off. Uh, he had to be taken out of the shot, his hand and top of his head was in the shot holding the horse still because they just didn't want to do any, I mean, movie horses will stop on a dime. They'll drop on a dime. You know, and none of the, you know, so we just, we had the horses for the write-up scenes and then we got rid of them. But still we had, our stunt doubles rode them in the early, in the early parts of the film. We had stunt doubles for all of my actors that were riding the fast shots. Um, I had two groin pulls from two of my lead actors, which is no fun when they're having to squat and be around. Every shot you saw in that film, the temperature was below freezing. And uh, in the night shots, we had a 25 mile an hour wind and 100% humidity on the Cape Fear River. We were honestly 50 yards from the river. So it was cold, it was windy, and the ground was frozen. So it was, Jim, Jim Cody said it was the most miserable but yet most fulfilling film he's ever done in his 125 projects. So, yeah. But horsing, I mean, the horses, I mean, we didn't really have, you know, animal control. Nobody ever came out, nothing like that, because we were just riding, you know, we were just riding. Um, no animals were hurt in the making of this film. Yes, sir. Oh, during the credits, uh, I saw bank teller one, two, and three. Yes. The voiceovers in the beginning of the film, when the guys are riding, you hear the bank robbery taking place. All right. I hired voice actors, or well, they're actors. I mean, Jane McNeil's on Walking Dead, and Peter Jurisic has been in everything from Babylon 5, 89 episodes of that. I mean, these are other working actors that we hired to go into a sound booth and do all the recording of that Foley in, in the bank as the robbery is going on. So originally when I wrote the movie in Los Angeles, I had, um, I had access to the, uh, to the Valuse Ranch, which is where they shot Deadwood. And then I moved and I didn't have access. A producing partner of mine who now lives in Florida had access and we were gonna shoot the actual bank robbery. And we will for the feature when we shoot the feature, but um, I'd written the bank robbery in, and I wanted to keep that in as kind of the intro to kind of have two things going on. You're seeing the getaway, but you're hearing the, the bank robbery at the same time, just to tell more story in less time. I like it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say how impressed I was with the entire experience. Um, I was really struck how quickly I developed empathy for every single character, and I believe the close-ups of the eyes and the faces that you mentioned really drew you in and, and allowed that. And without feeling sympathy for characters, I don't, you know, unless you really care about what's going to happen to them. Yeah. Well, I, I give a lot of credit to Brad Walker, our DP, and to Evan Vetter, my director. Um, they kind of came with that uh, decision uh, to shoot it that way. Um, these guys are, the, the storyline, the backstory is that the railroad is coming through the southeast from the coal fields of Kentucky down to Spartanburg and on to Charleston, South Carolina. And what they were doing right around the turn of the century was they were buying up these farms for a right-of-way and they were offering these poor farmers a pittance. And that's what's happened is the railroads come through trying to buy their land and they, they don't want to sell their land so the railroad guys hired somebody to kill all their cattle. So it's now dead of the winter. These guys have no food. Their, their smokehouse has been burned to the ground. So they're desperate to feed their family. So they ride three counties away and rob this bank to provide for their family and hopefully save the family farm. That's my backstory that, to what led up to what you just saw. So that will all be seen in the future. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, real quick. I've got to focus on the time piece. Is that a period antique piece, or is that just a prop? Nope, nope. That was real. I, I found it. That was a nightmare to find, actually. The, the guy who I actually rented that watch from for the entity, you know, the entire shoot, he is a master collector watchsmith. I don't know what you call them other than a watchsmith. But he had a really, an old one. Um, and we actually got his permission to use it and we had actually had a double for the actor to wear on the horse and then we gave him the real the real deal when we had the, the close-up shots and then we put the photo of his would-be wife in there so but yeah it was it was authentic and I returned it in one piece thankfully because it would have cost me a fortune to replace it yes sir for the feature um, if you had to replace the cast with Uh, it's a business. 
Uh, I, I don't think they would suffer, but, you know, but I, I've been replaced in movies by big names, and it, it stings, but, you know, I'm still doing it. You know, I'm still here 23 years later, but, you know, uh, I don't know. I just, I would hope that we're all above that, uh, and it is a business that show business. Um, I would find other roles for them in the film, other than the ones they play that's just more supporting roles. Um, and that, you know, sometimes my hands are tired as, as, are tied as the writer producer by the other producers, the pr people that come with the deep pockets. Mm -hmm. They say, we need Tommy Lee Jones, Billy Bob Thornton, and, you know, Stellan Skarsgård or whoever in the film just to put butts in seats. And that's what it's all about. It's a business. I mean, that's what Hollywood does. They don't make movies for the sake of art. They make them to put butts in seats and make money on them. So... This would be, even with my Western, even with my feature, it would be most likely an independent film, independent studio money. I can shoot the feature for, for, for about five million, um, and that's with name actors, cast, crew, horses, the whole, the real deal horses. Um, and Montana's really courting me hard right now to bring it out there, so. But I would love to shoot it right here in North Carolina, but we don't have a film industry here anymore. Uh, my daughter was telling me last week, and she hates that I have to go out of town to work, but it's what I do, and it's what I've been doing for almost a quarter century. I mean, I've got to go where the work is, and right now it's D.C. in two weeks, and then it's New Orleans and Atlanta and wherever else they call me to go. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's just finding the time to write the way I need to write. and I wrote 83 drafts of what you saw um, just to get it right, I mean, to fit that story into 22 minutes, you know. So it's... Um, it's not, it's not easy. Writing is rewriting, as they say. So, Anyway, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate you guys having us up, and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. And now I'm not quite done with you yet, oh. if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> now comes my questions. <laughs> 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 well, um, you mentioned uh, working in North Carolina, and I don't know if you all noticed, but when the credits for this short film rolled, just how many names were there and um and that was shot all in north carolina so um I, yeah i definitely would like to know like how many people that movie employed yeah we had um i don't know you'd call it employed we just uh we we caught we, we timed this perfectly in that the crews were just going on hiatus from big TV shows like Sleepy Hollow and Under the Dome. So those guys have just worked for nine months and made a fat paycheck uh, to support their families and their businesses and so forth. So we shot this on hiatus just as they were finishing up hiatus or coming off hiatus. So we got my sound guy, John Scoglin. He's wired and he's put mics on me for Iron Man 3 and a bunch of the other movies I've done. Um, but we, we had about 45 people every night, and that goes from the catering to the horse wrangler to the guy who was operating our fire to you know all the production assistants. I actually brought in, what I like to do in my films is I like to bring in interns. Um, I went to East Carolina University, I'm a, I'm a graduate from there. I guest lecture there and at UNCW. And then this year on my film, I put it out to East Carolina University. I wanted to bring at least three interns from campus and they had to be academically eligible. I wanted the top kids in the class. I wanted to, re to reward them with a credit before they graduate, and they're in the, all in the film production division of this art school of art. So I brought them on, um, and they're all working now in the industry, but I was able to give them their first IMDb credit uh, on my film as an intern. And they weren't listed as interns. They were listed as uh, Joe Tease, who was, he was a, my boom operator. He, he sh every voice you hear on that movie, he recorded it. Um, I've got another one, one of the girls that's, she's in Los Angeles now. She was just uh, working on The Voice and now she's doing a movie with uh, John Lithgow and behind the scenes. But um, we had about 45 every night and some of those, some of those roles rotated. You know, I could get this grip on this night or this electrician on this night. So every night was a little bit of a rotating door, some of the departments, but we had on average 45. I think one night we had 48 crew and then we had our cast as well. So. Um, we had, um, we had a lot of people. And then I, a lot of the names you saw there at the end, we had an Indiegogo campaign uh, to raise our, our money. Um, and I raised part of the money on Indiegogo, but I find that the crowdfunding sites 
are not what they're all cracked up to be because you're only going to reach your width of friends and family and people you know on social media. Joe Razumafraz out in Dubuque isn't going to give you $1,000 just because he's a nice guy. It, it just doesn't work that way. So what I found is that you hit up everybody you know for, and we had a, a, um, we had a, a fiscal sponsorship through um, a company out of New York City, so we had a, all of our, all of our donations were tax write-off, that we were 501c3. So um, Fractured Atlas was our, our fiscal sponsor out of New York City, so we were able to give tax credits back to those who donated financially to us. And then I had a couple angel investors that came in at the last minute to donate. And uh, you did uh, mention, because this guy has been around. He's been uh, with Iron Man 3, Hunger Games, Under the Dome, and uh, all those were filmed in North Carolina. Yeah. But uh, and more recently, uh, you've been on House of Cards, which is in Maryland, yeah. and uh, Stranger Things, which is in Georgia. Yeah. And uh, and you just mentioned that you are gonna you're planning on taking your feature to Montana. Maybe or Georgia. Is there anything you? We're very pro NC film, yeah. so is there anything um, you'd like to say? Because we are documenting all of this just yeah. to spread the awareness. Yeah, I would love to have the North Carolina Film Incentives back in place. I mean, that really is a boon to this industry. We're a clean industry. We're not leaving, you know. Um, ash everywhere in our rivers and streams. We clean up after ourselves. There's no physical harm done to the environment. Um, I, you know, the, the tax breaks that we had for these big studio films, it puts a lot of people to work. And a lot of these are s small business owners that have... The guy that, that did my fire, that was not a real fire, that was a gas-fed fire that we had a line trenched underground and we had a guy manning a gas tank to keep that, those flames at certain heights for different camera angles. And the guy, the special effects guy, his company is in Wilmington, North Carolina. His business was devastated and he's probably, truth be told, in Georgia somewhere right now having to work away from his family who lives here um, because the film left here. When, when our current governor went into office, he ended all film incentives. And it crushed a lot of families in eastern North Carolina and, and ch the Charlotte area as well. I just did a table read for a pilot that's shooting in Charleston right now, a uh, week before last, and the entire crew from that was on Good Behavior, the last show that was in production in North Carolina in Wilmington. They have all are down there shooting a pilot away from their families. They don't get to sleep in their bed at night. They have to sleep in a hotel room. Um, and then they come home on the weekends when they can. Our, our weeks usually start early. Our, our call times are usually 6.30 or 7 in the morning on Mondays. And by the end of the week, we're going in at noon because we work on average about a 14-hour day. So if you go in at noon, you can expect to get off about midnight or 2 a.m. So that's on a Friday. So you're not going to get home to the wife and kids that night. You're going to have to drive Saturday morning and then turn around Sunday night to drive back for a Monday morning early call time. So your weekends are shot. So it's great to live at home so you can drive eight miles across town or 10 or whatever it is, sleep in your own bed and get up and spend the weekend with your family. But we don't get to do that anymore thanks to the politicians that don't see it worthwhile to make film in North Carolina. I mean, you go back 30 years to Matlock. I mean, we've, we've always had film and television in North Carolina. Sleeping with the Enemy was shot here. And I mean, Iron Man alone I don't know how much money they spent in North Carolina on small businesses, but a dear friend of mine has a uh, industrial supply company in Wilmington, and he just sold to that uh, production alone over $100,000 in PVC and little gadgets and you know widgets for whatever they needed for that film, screws and nuts and bolts and that kind of stuff. That's just one business, and it didn't decimate his business. He has a very established business in the industrial arena, but. That movie brought a lot of money to North Carolina, and it put a lot of, they don't think about the bed and breakfast, the, the oceanfront houses that the producers and the actors stay in on Figure Eight Island that they have to rent out a week at a time, or the 60 Enterprise rental cars that are rented that have to be maintained by somebody here in North Carolina. You know, there, there's a, it's a trickle down. There's or a, lot of, a lot of people who are affected. The guy, I know a guy who's in Hampstead, North Carolina, he repairs the bodywork on all Enterprise cars between Newburn, Wilmington, and Raleigh. So when 
they're driving one of those 15 passenger vans through some through the woods to some remote location they hit a a rock or something and it puts a ping in the side of the door that's the guy that pulls the dent out of the door for enterprise he's affected so it's a lot of people that the government doesn't even consider they only see the hard numbers they don't see the guys three and four steps down the chain so not to be political but you asked the question i did and uh just one more quick thing yeah. just uh because in case anybody is interested in following your career which is uh well on its way uh there's a new show i guess on hulu stephen king's cell are uh, you yeah it's um yeah it's cell it's um it's out, it was in theaters earlier in the summer, now it's on most of your pay-per-view, red box, blah, 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 all those outlets where you get your DVDs now. Um, I saw an old blockbuster building a minute ago, um, coming up the road. Um, but yeah, it's uh, Stephen King's, um, Todd Williams directed it, um, it's with Sam Jackson and John Cusack. I play crazy Ray Huizinga, uh, I've got a really twisted and corrupt role in that one. Um, but that was a lot of fun. And then I've got LBJ directed by Rob Reiner, which is the biopic about Lyndon B. Johnson, which should be in theater soon, I guess. And I'm gonna go do another film with Rob Reiner next month up in um, DC, it's a political drama called Shock and All. So anyway, that's fine, so. Awesome, thanks Tony so much for coming out. Thank you all.